Chapter 22, March 1984 Just need one pan to boil water for tea. Hardly any dishes to wash, thank God, except for my cup. Once in a while I do need to rinse out my cup. And a knife. I need the knife to cut slices of cheese, to butter bread, have to force myself to eat half an apple, a carrot, a handful of raisins. Exhausted. Inert. All day long I sit alone in front of the fire, staring into it, dulled eyes sucked into the oblivion of bright, hot heat. All the fire gone out of me, no life left. The fire inside, now outside, where I can look at it, recognize it, understand it. Feel cold, so cold. The fire heats, warms, feels good. Can't get enough. Can't get close enough. Jump up. Stand next to it. Legs spread wide. Hands spread out over it, swaying back and forth. Sit here in front of the fire, hunched over, rocking back and forth, rocking the trance of primal motion. Can't get warm enough, no matter how hot the fire. Want to feel the hollowness inside, to feel my whole being inside the fire, consumed by it. As if somehow contact with this tiny, confined conflagration will both sear me of my sins and eventually reactivate my energy. Not that I'll ever be an activist again. Peace activist? Sure. That chance. I was a violent peace activist, so caught up in furious rage against those who would rage against others that I didn't recognize myself as a prime example of what must change. So identified with the content of the message I was trying to force others to understand that I was not sensitive to my own violence against them. Peace activist? Ha! Let me say these words. Say them again and again. Say them this time with meaning. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Sitting here alone for three months now, gone from the world, depleted. All the fire inside transferred to the little black box squatting before me, its heavy iron door open to my eyes, humming with combustion, radiating heat. The fire sucks memories from my bones, draws them out like strings. I see the events of my life stretching from the present back into the deep, deep past as inevitable chains of cause and effect, all stemming from one original cause, that brilliant white flash of world destruction which both terrified me and magnetized me as a child. I imprinted on it, chewed it up into tiny, brilliant flashes of rage, energizing muscles, tendons, bones, nerves. All my life I've run on nervous energy, fired by fear of violence. All my life I've been violent, violently against violence. All my life all I see is war and threats of war. I've been afraid of that which I most expected and drew it to me made it mine, made myself into my own image of what I most fear and hate. I am the violence of which I speak against so scathingly. I am the one who pushes the button to trigger the Holocaust. Hot golden flames enveloping blackening wood to glowing red coals firing tiny blue-gold orange flames spreading alighting brilliant rooms in hell, hissing me forth calling my eyes to enter them, to become one, be done, gone, gone out like a light. My eyes flit in and out of hell's growing chambers. My eyes are magnetized by the light, the light, light of the darkest night. Fanatics' eyes. They would kill to preserve what they love. As a wild animal slinks off into the woods to lick its wounds, so did I slink off to allow the fire to lick the wounds of violence within myself, curled up, hunched in my little chair in front of the little fire, wrapped in silent solitude, 
wintering winds howling outside, fire was my intimate partner, lost in internal reflections, mind looping back through memory, images stirring thought. Voice breaks through harshly into the silence, its raspy whispers startling. Yes! Oh no! My God, it's true! And the fire hisses back. The fire was my lover. I could not leave the fire, could not take my eyes off the fire, could not get enough of the fire, wanted to be warmed by it, comforted. We were one, the fire and I, caught up in mutual, alchemizing, penetrating, searing the dross of what had become my wooden being. I stopped the world that desolate winter, consumed by flames. I stopped the world, and I got off. I began that vigil on New Year's Eve, 1984, with fear in my heart. 1984, the year we had all been dreading. Orwell's year. I stared into the fire, and I kept a fresh-cut red rose blooming beside me during that long winter of 1984, replacing it with another every few days as my offering to the eventual replenishment of life on Earth. As the days began to grow longer, snow melting off and ground thawing, as life within the soil began to swell and thrust up tiny green shoots, I too began to feel life begin to stir within. One early morning, I awoke to the sound of birds celebrating the dawn. This was not unusual. Since childhood, I've preferred this time of awakening. On this particular morning, however, I had the strange experience of actually being consciously aware of the process of moving from deep sleep to wakefulness. Suddenly, at one particular point still deep within the sleeping state, but moving quickly to the surface, my awareness was arrested, steadied, there. I experienced my being as a point of light buried within the thick wall that had become my body. So thick was the wall that I could only barely hear the birds on the other side of it. It was as if I was hearing them from a long way off, though I knew they were just outside. This discovery shocked me profoundly. Its meaning slowly and ponderously vibrated from deep inside out through what had become the dense compression of my material being. I realized so dense was the wall of my body that I could not even experience what had been since childhood the deep inner joy of my body resonating instantly and with abandon to the harmonic vibration of birdsong. This experience made a lasting impression. My body as having constructed from its own substance a thick wall separating consciousness from body's original capacity to sensitively attune to the natural world. That morning I made a solemn vow. I will work to dissolve the wall. Eventually, my body will be purified and detoxified to such an extent that it will vibrate like the skin of a drum to again receive the singing of birds resounding inside me. Speaking now in late 1989, little did I know back then how long and slow and profound this process is, is proving to be that it has in fact transformed the whole of my life. Now I can say only as I learn to listen to the subtle whispers of what my body tells me, do I truly attune to health, to love, to life on earth. Back then, as April unfolded, I sighed with relief to detect the first faint perfume of spring ruffling the breezes. I sensed that perhaps, after all, since the human race had made it through the winter of 1984, despite our collective fear of it, we might actually be beginning again. That something perhaps had changed. That we might yet save the planet. And what had seemed equally impossible until the alchemy of those months sitting mesmerized in front of the fire, that I might even save my own soul. 
Chapter 23 October 1984 The designer kitchen spreads out lavishly at one end of the spacious, high-ceiling log room with picture windows on two sides, overlooking the rushing river. I am standing at the sink, washing the few dishes the two of us have used for lunch, trying to do them carefully, quietly. Rod is in the bedroom, napping, asleep, I hope. Don't want to awaken him. Here for two weeks now, helping him to recuperate from kidney surgery. Still reeling with the shock of this latest sudden and enormous change in my life and puzzled. Want to understand. Had no idea when I met him that he would be hospitalized and in critical condition only one week later. Had no idea when I met him that I was about to enter into another intense process with a very sick man. Though the resemblance is uncanny, I must remember the two situations are in reality utterly unlike. Phil was a bad man. Rod is a good man, a spiritual man. Indeed, this relationship, the first in my entire life, which is foremost of the spirit. I sense in our union the possibility of that which I have always longed for, what has haunted me, a true communion of souls, a meeting of the finest in us both. He's sick now, weak, can't do anything for himself. Thank God I'm here to help him. And he's still suffering, sensitive soul that he is from a particularly devastating divorce. I can help him here too, let him know what a fine person he is, how it was meant to be, how even if he can't see it now, his divorce is not a failure but a new beginning, a brand new lease on life. Inspire him into full aliveness, Guide him in uncovering the beauty of his original nature so he can truly become the partner I long for, so we can live out the dream of a perfect union, the true communion that has haunted both of us all our lives. We were introduced to each other for the first time last January. Both of us were panelists in a public discussion on peace. Him as a concerned citizen, me as an activist. My swan song as an activist. Our report was instant. During that evening, we functioned as subliminal partners, we agree now, though it would be nine more months before he would be able to end his long and troubled marriage. And now, now, what great good fortune to have landed here in this wonderful house with this good man after the searing solitude of winter, the vow to heal myself in spring. I prayed for life on earth and I ask that my own life begin again, and it has, with an abundance greater than I ever dreamed. The birds are calling me, calling me, calling me to paradise. Chapter 24, October 1986. Oh good, the water is finally boiling. I can do the dishes now. Arising from the big easy chair, sitting regally in the center of this one-room cabin, I walk the few feet to the kitchen counter, where I remove the kettle from the wood cook stove and pour steaming water into one of two big stainless steel bowls. I use the other one to wash my body. The daily rituals of ablution are simple, exacting, and comforting. Grab two buckets, one in each hand, walk over to my landlady's house, fill them with the spigot outside. Two one-gallon buckets. All I need for an entire day's supply of water. Outhouses in back. The daily ritual of using this primitive method to do the dishes, to sponge my body, has become profoundly satisfying. Ground me into the here and now. Right here. Right now. All the excess of my life gradually eliminating, contracting me to essence. All my life projecting self out into the world, then living as if I were out there, inside those projections, basking sometimes in the glamour of illusion, disappointed more often when what does not come to pass was not what I had in mind jerked around like a marionette on strings by the ephemeral phantoms of ideas, 
ideas which come from, quote, on high, unquote, and have no connection to the rest of me, my body, the slow ebb and flow of feelings that I cannot conceptualize and which, therefore, I prefer not to notice. The quickness of my mind, it runs away with me. It runs away from me, the rest of me. The split between the two, body and mind, widens as time goes on. The denial of the expression of feeling becomes so profound, finally, that compression forces feelings to implode, producing abnormal situations which sooner or later I will have to become aware of, acknowledge, and work through, or manifest chronic, debilitating disease. All my life, ignoring my body, what it has to teach me, not only about itself, but about its links to the larger world, Earth herself, of which it is an aspect. My body, my personal portion of Earth, my body as primary Earth for me. As Earth is a body, so am I. For both of them, the laws of nature hold. To attune to my body is automatically to be in tune with Earth. In this respect, we are one, synchronized. And Earth herself in her living context as a heavenly body. My body lives upon a heavenly body. I link to the heavens, not by putting my head in the clouds, but by sinking down into the dark, rich soil of personal experience, the way my body actually feels at this moment, right here, right now. My time with Rod taught me that, slammed me right into my feelings, wrenched me wide open, exposed the ancient wound. What goes up must come down. Our view of relationships, of ourselves as soulmates, was so utopian, so exalted, that it could only pop like a balloon. Together, we yearned for an ideal world and saw in each other the lover of our dreams. Neither of us wanted to notice the pockmarks, the quirks, the various ghosts we had dragged with us from the past, specific signposts of our separate personal histories which had carved us into the unique individuals we had become. We didn't want to be individuals. We wanted to forget our separate selves and drown in an infinite sea of compassion. We were so wrapped up in our projection of perfection that we refused to incorporate the definitive actuality of the world we were in fact living in and which was begging us to slow down, to accommodate something other than the vision we were reaching for. Together, we used our relationship to escape the world, its muted cries, its anxious suffering, Together, we lifted into the clouds so high that we could no longer tell what was real, what not, so high that there was nothing to hold on to, no way to distinguish this from that. We were drifting, disoriented, lost in space, lost in confusion. Finally, we lost contact altogether, and I fell, hurtled howling through space to crash horribly splattering all over the ground. The end of that affair was the beginning of my allowing myself to truly experience my own emotional pain. In crashing to the ground, I finally connected with my emotional body, with the pain that body had been holding, the abyss of abandonment. I lost my head with him and fell into the black hole of personal anguish, which did not actually begin with Rod, but long, long before. That was several years ago. For the first time, I didn't just pick myself up and go on as if nothing had happened, didn't just slink off into the wilderness until I felt good again and then forget my time out there. I could no longer distract myself from what I was feeling. My center of gravity had shifted. I was no longer a mind that had a body. Now my mind was in my body, deep down inside it. Mind was caught inside the tight thrumming cage of the solar plexus. 
Mind was holding the labored beating of a heart so walled off from the rest of me, so constricted, so isolated, when its exaltation lies in connection. That this poor heart felt like it was literally breaking in two. I surrendered. I gave myself up to the actuality of the present moment, and that moment was simply pain. Allowing the pain to be there, to take me over, to become one with it, to hurtle me backwards in time, to when I was nine months old and my father wrenched himself away from my mother and myself for the agony of World War II, when my mother also abandoned me emotionally, so beside herself was she with the anxiety of wondering whether he would ever return. Orphan Annie, I call the tiny child who was suddenly kicked, terrified, with no warning and no way to comprehend, into the frozen void. Suddenly pulled off the breast and weaned to a cup, suddenly left alone to cry for long hours in the middle of the afternoon, in the dark dead of night, suddenly my father overseas, and my mother a million miles away. Orphan Annie, I hold her close to my heart, comfort her, sway her back and forth in the womb of primal motion. I feel a tenderness towards this child within me, a tenderness that I have never been able to feel for anyone, even my own poor children from whom I am still estranged. I left them as small boys, now they are in their early twenties, and with whom I have had no contact for six long years. Spiraling down into the long, dark tunnel with no light at the end of it, surrendering to the unrelenting agony, years upon years of stored anguish over the unnatural wrenching from my own children. The pain sinks me into the earth, contracts me to a dense, tense, gravid condition. Pain penetrates my entire being, takes me over, overwhelming darkness, feel suffocated, sucked into vacuum. The sheer terror of asphyxiation, the utterly mindless panic of being so contracted, so compressed, that there is no room for that primal and ultimate exchange of energy between self and the world. The pain of feeling unable to breathe in the past is so acute I automatically hold my breath in the present, hold it until I begin to turn blue in the face. Consciously and deliberately, I begin to breathe into the point of most pain. No matter how much more pain it causes me to do this, consciously and deliberately, I intend the circling of air to begin to gently massage that dense mass. The pain is resistant, unrelenting, a huge leaden stone crushing my chest. Continue breathing consciously, more and more deeply. Allow the pain to be there. Honor it. Be one with the pain, one with the breathing. Gradually penetrating pain with the breath, oxygenating pain to the point where it finally begins to vibrate, to breathe on its own. Consciously breathing into the pain, in and out, in and out, the rhythm of this repeating movement setting up a momentum which entrains that which surrounds it. Gradually the motion of the molecules in vibration continues to speed up swelling into fullness, admitting light. Ancient wounds when fully acknowledged and allowed. Ancient agony when its depth and mystery and wisdom is truly honored, gradually expands to open up space within it, a channel for the wind to whistle through on its way from one end of the universe to the other. Opening up space precisely within the greatest suffering, moving through suffering to open new space, pure potency, primal chaos, rich womb from which creation is born. Suffering transforms into sacrifice. 
The sacrifice of extreme density is an opening, a door to the beyond. A sacred initiation accomplished through mutation. Instinct itself transforms as I consciously and deliberately move into that from which formerly I had instinctively recoiled, so terrified was I of feeling the pain I did not want to admit was there. Sacrifice consecrates into rejoicing. It floods my being and expands in all directions to join with earth. We are one, one being, refracting into billions of tiny cells, each with its own specialized integrity, all organized into larger, more complex units, moving and swaying as different points in one swelling, subsiding, oceanic tide. The rhythmic vibrating fullness of my being is earth being, is our being radiating out in all directions into the heavens. The heavens are singing. The heavens sing the song of birds. The heavens sing the glory of God. Death, followed by resurrection. Death, and prior to resurrection, three days of lying, lifeless, in the tomb. The self that had denied my own emotional pain had died, and I was now lying in the tomb, dead. I had entered upon a process which would take time, which would require trust, which called for patience, understanding, and total acceptance of the slowness, the reluctance of ancient wounds to heal. Months upon months of centering in the solar plexus and heart, the terrible compression there. Meanwhile, during this time, I noticed that the coming November full moon would be occurring on the precise point in the zodiac at which the moon was located during the moment of my birth, 23 degrees Taurus. As an astrologer, I was interested in this phenomenon, what it would mean for me. I circled the date and awaited it, fascinated. I assumed it would somehow resonate with the emotional work I was doing now, since the moon, astrologically, is symbolic of subconscious memories, mother and child, the deeply emotional female nature. Perhaps some kind of catharsis or illumination? Would this full moon herald the climax and subsequent release of old pain? November 19th, two days after the full moon, I receive a letter from my mother containing news of my children. One of them had written to her, the first news in six years. That night my menstrual period arrived, and with it I noticed that a hard and stony old lump deep within the left side of my groin had softened and enlarged. The next day the lump was larger still and painful. Over the following days it continued to grow, meanwhile gradually rising from deep within to just beneath the skin. At this point the lump, originally about the size of my little fingernail, had ballooned to the size of a ping-pong ball. Extremely painful. I could barely walk. Over the next 24 hours it changed shape to become like a cone or a volcano. At this point I began twice daily soaks in Epsom salt baths, covering the area afterwards with healing clay to draw out whatever was in there. One day more and the lump turned carbuncle began to weep. My internal time bomb turned volcano erupted, but very slowly and gradually, taking another four or five days to completely flush out. My mood during this entire time was ecstatic. I knew intuitively that this clearing from deep within the left female side of the groin sexual area of the body was the climax I had been looking for, that I had stored emotional pain in this lump from the time of my childbearing years. For several years previous to the time of its enlargement and surfacing, I had known intuitively that this worrisome little lump would someday turn cancerous if I didn't release it. 
I had made a conscious intention, given my body the instruction, to do just that. I intended that at the point when I was emotionally ready for it, this release would take place. And here was the event I had long anticipated, without knowing exactly how it would manifest, concurring with the full moon exactly upon my moon, and synchronous with the time of receiving news about my children. What another might have perceived as a horrible thing happening to his or her body, I perceived as a victory, knowing with every fiber of my being that the clearing of this small, dense, poisoned pocket of congealed energy was the beginning of emotional liberation. Exactly one year to the day after this catharsis, I was in Boston with my mother, preparing to visit first the father of my children and finally those long-lost children themselves.